It is a pleasure to present something about Eric Kramer, who was a pioneer female chemist. Uh, she worked when females were not very prominent in the field of chemistry, and so we can consider her a pioneer. And we look at her family. She comes from a family of faculty. Her great-grandfather, her grandfather, and then her father were university professors, as were her brothers, so that she didn't have to overcome the prejudice against women and faculty, but she still had to overcome many obstacles as she progressed in her career. At the University of Berlin, uh, Erika was originally from Austria, but she ended up going to Berlin after she got her bachelor's degree to study at the University of Berlin. She obtained her PhD in 1927, working under her PhD director, Max Bodenstein. Bodenstein was a well-known German chemist who established the free radical mechanism for halides reacting with alkanes, etc. Uh, after she obtained her PhD, she had some difficulty in obtaining a permanent position, as did women at that time. Uh, so that she ended up working with a number of well-known chemists of the time, uh, first at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, then at the universities, other universities in Germany. She worked with a number of well-known scientists, uh, Bonhoeffer, whose brother was uh, executed during the Second World War. Uh, Polanyi, whose son went on to obtain a PhD. Many felt that Polanyi should have obtained one for his work on absorption, but he didn't. She worked with Otto Hahn, who obtained the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work in nuclear uh, energy. She was also a friend and worked with Lisa Meitner, who was a well-known female physicist who many feel should have gotten the Nobel Prize with on, but who did not get the prize. Uh, she actually is the one who explained, theoretically, the experimental data that Hahn obtained on nuclear reactions. I, in 1938, she did her uh, habitation at the University of Berlin, so that after that she was able to have students. Uh, in 1940, she, because of the shortage of faculty, because of men serving in the Second World War, she was granted a position at the University of Innsbruck, but it was with the understanding that when the men returned from military service that she would give up her position. However, during the five years that she was a faculty member, she did so well that when the war ended and Austria became independent again, she was appointed head of the Institute of Physical Chemistry at Innsbruck University. Early on in her career at the University of Innsbruck, she worked with a group who was studying the uh, hydrogenation of acetylene in the presence of large amounts of ethene. Uh, the acetylene needs to be removed because it causes problems in the properties of the polyethylene that you make from ethylene. She needed some analytical method 
in order to determine the amount of acetylene and hydrogenation. I, she had a student in 1943 who was working on his thesis for absorption isotherm of acetylene and ethylene. Also, she read a book which described some chromatographic work, and she made the analogy of the molecule to small boats floating on the river. The boat floats along the river for a ways, goes to the shore, is tied up for some time, and then is released. She related the retention time of the molecule to the time the boat was tied up, developed an equation which described the absorption of molecules as it would apply going down a column in a gas chromatograph. She wrote this up in a manuscript. She submitted it. It was evaluated. She got back the suggested corrections and made those corrections. She mailed it back to the journal, but unfortunately, an Allied bombing raid, while it was in the mail, destroyed the headquarters of the journal, and so it was never published. Uh, following the Second World War, she remained on as a faculty member. Uh, Austria was undergoing rather severe conditions following the Second World War. There was a scarcity of equipment. Spare parts could not be bought. They were too expensive. She had a student, who uh, Fritz Pryor, who was interested in working on a PhD, and so she took him as a student. But in order to do the research, this student had to ride his bicycle for about 15 meters to a building that wasn't destroyed by bombing and set up the equipment. This was rather elementary equipment. It was put together from spare parts. There was a new generator to generate the gas, a chip apparatus where she could generate the hydrogen. She used hydrogen as a carrier gas. This was a totally manually operated equipment, so it took three people one to generate the hydrogen, one to make the readings on the chromatograph, and one to record the readings by hand. And so they set up an apparatus, had it working, and they got phenomenally good results. However, she was not prompt in publishing this work. First of all, the journals were sparse that she had access to. Uh, when she did publish them, they were not in the most widely circulated journals, and so she didn't receive the initial respect for the work that she was doing that she should have. The apparatus is diagrammed, uh, the hydrogen generation, the columns, uh, the recording equipment uh, w was set up, the recording was set up as a wheatstone bridge that required manual operation. Uh, it was a very elementary piece of equipment, but it worked and gave surprisingly good results. If we look at one of the chromatograms, this one is a separation of a acetylene and vinyl chloride, we see that we get nearly baseline separation. Uh, the area under each peak would be correspond to the weight percent of the material that's present. And so they would use a planimeter to integrate the area by hand, record the area, and then relate this 
to the amount of material present. The separation of ethylene and acetylene, which they were really interested in, gave baseline separation so that you can see in this chromatogram the nitrogen was the internal standard, then ethylene and then acetylene and from the area under the curve for each compound they could obtain quantitatively the amount that was present. She continued working in the area of gas chromatography I list a number of, of the students who got their PhD under her direction. Uh, she was very productive and during the first 10 years of her academic career following 1945, she was on the average producing two to four PhDs per year, which is actually a large number. I came to know Hans Gruber who was a PhD student of hers in 1956 uh, when he came to the United States to work at Atlantic Refining Company on characterization of petroleum fractions. And he arranged for me to get a half hour video made of Professor Kramer. Uh, the Chrom chromatography has been around a long time, but a great advance was made in 1941 when partition chromatography, in which one liquid phase is held stationary on some support such as chromatographic paper, and the other one is then mobile. And by the combination of the two phases, you can separate a number of components. This was widely used by people in biology where it's difficult to make the separations. I say in 1951 Kramer published finally the work that she started in 1944 on gas chromatography. The gas chromatography that she did was gas solid where you have the, react the compounds present in the gas phase and they are absorbed on a solid and depending on how strongly they're absorbed will determine how long it takes before they elute from the end of the column. She wrote these up in three articles which were published in German uh, scientific literature. About the same time in 1951, one of the people, Martin, who was one of the people working on partition chromatography, decided to do gas liquid chromatography. This is similar to what Kramer was doing, except now the compounds are dissolved in the liquid which is present on a support. And so the thing that determines when they elute from the column will be the solubility in the liquid. Uh, it turns out that this gas chromatography became of interest to people in petroleum and was very quickly adapted for petroleum use. The gas liquid was more adaptable than the gas solid, so gas liquid was the direction that most of the commercial organizations took. In 1952, Martin got a Nobel Prize for his work on paper chromatography together with Singe, who was the other person working with him on it. Uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1952 to Sand and to Martin. If we look, this is Eric Kramer as a young child and then as a younger woman. And then later on when she was doing the work in chromatography about 1950. And finally, in 1990, when she was then 90 years old, 
where she's at a meeting with one of her students who worked on the initial gas chromatograph and you can see uh, a model of their gas chromatograph off to the left in the picture. Okay.